Good morning, everybody. Uh, according to NHS uh, improvement, 200,000 patients develop new pressure ulcer in, in the last year. They developed pressure ulcer in the last year. And NHS spends a whopping 1.4 million pounds per day to treat these patients in this country. That is about 500 million pounds in a year. I work in uh, a spinal injuries unit, a specialized center, and uh, we cover a population of 10 million West Midlands, um, part of North Wales, Mid Wales, and part of Cheshire as well. And the spinal cord injury patients, more than 60% of them develop a pressure ulcer at some point in their life. And the risk is higher if the level of the injury or the spinal cord injury is higher. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. It could just be an erythematous area, superficial skin loss, or a sinus, or very complicated wounds. And you all know the importance of MDT approach and uh, holistic care of these patients. Spinal cord injury, as well as the pressure of some management. And it's more important when see cases like this. This patient spent about a year in the hospital. The number of cases is on the rise, but the resources are limited. The number of beds hasn't increased in the last 10 years, especially in the spinal cord injuries world. And there's a pressure to manage these patients in the community. I don't need to tell you the number of dressings that are available that can be applied to these wounds, including negative pressure wound therapy. So you need expert knowledge in the wound management. Not only that, the primary diagnosis as well. More important is knowing what complications that can develop in these patients with pressure ulcers and how to avoid them. First thing is try to help them, but do no harm. So over the last few years, as my experience in the management of these patients improved, I came to know that there are complications can develop Pressure ulcer itself is a complication for spinal cord injury, and there are complications of pressure ulcers in these patients. And identifying them and treating them as early as possible will improve the patient quality of life as well as save a lot of money for the NHS. This list is not exhaustive. I categorized some of the problems that can happen with pressure ulcers and with the hope that we can identify these conditions as early as possible and institute treatment sooner. Coming to assessment difficulties. I got case examples to illustrate the points. This is a gentleman, 73 year old, a tetraplegic patient, complete tetraplegia. He was mobilizing in a wheelchair and had a problem with the cushion of the wheelchair. It bottomed out and he spent a few hours there. And that's what he's developed in the ischial region. You can see erythema and in the center of the wound, in the center of the area, you can see what it looks like a fresh bruising. Okay, we looked at it and immediately put him on bed rest. Within two days, the skin condition improved apparently. But when I palpated the area, I felt like massive lumps underneath the skin. So if the patient has been mobilized straight away after looking at the skin, this deep tissue injury would have got worse. We did a lot of investigations and the MRI scan, you can see at the bottom, I don't know whether you can see it here, you can see the amount of deep tissue injury extending all the way into the subcutaneous fatty tissue as well as into the muscles as well. It took him more than three weeks for that to resolve and to be mobilized again in a wheelchair. So 
Inspection is only a part of the assessment. The palpation, the checking the consistency of the tissues, and also the investigations play a major role as well. This is another patient, a complete paraplegic. What you can see at the top fall one is an ischial pressure ulcer with a lot of sloughy tissue there. The bottom one is a sacral ulcer. But this gentleman, when he developed this spinal cord injury, it was a, because of a polytrauma, motorbike accident. He had fractures of the pelvis, fractures of the femur. And when we looked at the, and had an amputation as well on the right side below knee. When we looked at the, the amputation side and uh, the um, thigh region, there are multiple wounds there. There are on the lateral aspect of the knee, middle aspect of the knee, which is quite rare for any pressure area. So we investigated this further. The x-ray showed um, an in intermediary nail used for fixation of the femur. And then MRI scan of the limb showed multiple abscesses in the thigh. You can see the white areas. And some of them are there in the gluteal muscles as well. This is all related to the infected intramedullary nail. So is this pressure ulcer a result of some infection underneath? Patient presented with sepsis. So if we just did the debridement of the wound that is seen, then it was never going to cure the patient completely. So he had the nail taken out, debridement done at multiple sites, all the abscesses opened up and uh, the wounds started to heal. Next one is epibole, a phenomenon that can be seen in some of the patients. It refers to a ruled wound edge. The wound heals from the edges with epithelization onto the middle of the wound. But in some conditions, for unknown reasons, or reasons not completely clear, the epithelization doesn't happen, and the edge becomes dry and hyperkeratotic. I've seen it, this condition in many of the wounds. Three patients I've seen here, all of them are trochanteric pressure ulcers. You can see where the black arrows are there, the wound edge is rolled. And at the bottom, where the red arrows are there, you can see the epithelization happening. Okay? So if the same epithelization has happened on the top edge as well, the wound would have healed much quicker. But because of this phenomenon of epibole, it doesn't happen. That can delay the wound healing quite a long time. Most often, you need surgical excision of the rolled edge to stimulate the healing process again and try to attempt closure. The patient on this side de de decided not to have any surgical intervention. You can see the amount of epithelization happened all the way at the bottom, but at the top, the epithelization didn't happen. So um, it took more than a year for the patient to completely heal. There are so many reasons described why an epibol could happen, but the exact reason still is not very clear. More research is needed into the causes of this phenomenon. Management, as I said earlier, most often you, you need sharp surgical debridement of the edge to stimulate the healing process. But in patients where it is not possible, or if the patient doesn't want any surgical intervention, there are some case reports of uh, using uh, polymeric membrane dressings and also other case reports using hyperbaric oxygen and electrical stimulation to stimulate the healing process again. But in my experience, surgical intervention is needed to make the healing process much quicker. There are certain preventive aspects that have been described. Uh, main important uh, one is pressure relief and also packing the 
wound to eliminate any dead space. Osteomyelitis, very common in the pressure ulcers because most of the pressure ulcers are related to bony prominences. This patient who is in his 40s is a C4 level complete tetraplegic, came with two wounds. One is an ischial wound which has necrotic tissue and another innocent looking superficial wound on the left elbow. He presented with sepsis to one of the local acute hospitals and everybody thought that the ischial wound which looks much necrotic is the culprit. But when we did the x-ray, the middle one, whole of the bone underneath is destroyed with infection and patient had a pathological fracture which is extending <coughs> into the elbow joint. Looking back at the x-rays taken a month prior to that in, uh, with the GP surgery showed a tiny spot of osteopenia in that area. Elbow and the olecranon process the bone is a subcutaneous bone. There's no tissue there. So the moment the tissue damage have, goes into the periosteum, the bone gets affected. So he had to have a debridement, taken off all the pieces of bone, infected bone, need to have an external fixator for a period of three months to salvage the joint. And in the end, we managed to salvage the joint. He had preserved good range of movements in the elbow joint, but you can see most of the bone of the olecranon process is missing. Next one, my dreaded topic, and uh, in a way I've seen some cases of that, is retained dressing materials. This is a gentleman who presented with a small sinus in the Ishkel area, more than six months duration. And you can see from the uh, measuring scale there, that's hardly anything, it's just about a centimeter size, but a lot of copious discharge coming through that one. And had an MRI scan, which showed that the wound is actually extending quite deep up to the bone, and is actually extending medial to the bone as well, into the deeper tissues. And the picture on, the, on this side, at the top, shows when we examined with the probe, it was actually extending up to seven to eight centimeters depth. When I took him to the theater to debride the wound, this is what I found in the center of the wound, in the depths. Okay. With that dressing material in the depths of the wound, it would never heal. The wound would never heal. Another case example. Another innocent looking ischial sinus. The patient developed Another lump in the trochanteric area, if you can see the small one at the sinus at the bottom and another red area at the top. We thought that was another deep tissue injury and patient is on bed rest anyway, it would heal. We did the debridement for the ischial sinus and, but that area keeps on coming up, improving, getting worse again, improving intermittently. Investigations were done and uh, nothing significant was picked up. That was in June. By October, obviously the, after the first one, he developed the other swelling. And when we looked at it, the radiologists were not sure. They, on the MRI scan, they mentioned it as an inflammatory mass. And then we did a CT scan. They said it could be abscess because there's some gas shadows. He had all the investigations. An ultrasound scan showed very vascular tissue and what looked like unnatural things in the wound there. So I took him to theater to explore the wound. The moment I gave the incision, that's what I found, a dressing material. If you look back into the MRI scan, actually 
you can see the, this is the Ishkil wound, and you can see the tracking through which the dressing material has migrated. So not only retained dressing materials cause delayed wound healing, they can actually, any foreign body, anywhere in the body can migrate. And uh, um, as soon as the uh, material was taken out, that has uh, healed completely. He didn't even need further surgery for the, uh, uh, for the ischial sinus. The moment we took the foreign body, it was healed on its own. It's not something unheard of with uh, especially the negative pressure wound therapy, the vac dressings. Uh, foam material has been found in the wounds. There are at least two uh, reported uh, series, one with two cases and the other one with 11, 11 cases of foam material left in the wounds. So it's very, very important to um, check whatever is being put in, whatever is being taken out at each dressing change. So awareness among the health professionals about retained dressing materials because these are not easily identified on the radiological investigations. Not many of the dressing materials that we use have got radio opaque markers. So once they disappear into the wounds, only at the surgery they'll be found out. It's very difficult to pick them on the radiological investigations. So you need to have a high index of suspicion. Ask one of, the, one of my colleagues, a senior colleagues. He has got a collection of these. He, when I went to his office, he showed me with different bottles with all the retained dressing materials taken. I said, how do, you, how do you suspect? You say high index of suspicion. How would you get high index of suspicion? His words are, I can tell with the amount of discharge that is coming through. Apparently, there will be more copious amount of discharge coming through but it's very subjective, uh, subjective uh, finding. So in summary, um, immediate pressure relief is important for managing pressure ulcers. If you take up one thing, pressure relief. Um, one of the um, famous people in smile injuries world, Sir Gutman, said, you can put anything on the pressure ulcer, but not the patient. Okay? So pressure relief is important. And we went through assessment difficulties. Beware of the complications that can happen, especially osteomyelitis. And also, keep an eye out for any factor that can, that can delay the wound healing. Patients already spend months and months in beds. We don't want to add to that. And imagine how much money you can save if you can save one day of the uh, patient treatment period for all the patients that develop pressure ulcers in, the, in a year, you save 1.4 million a day. You can treat tens and fifteens of patients with that much amount of money. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any quick questions at all? No? Oh, one. When there's no obvious um, reason for, oh, sorry, how many patients do you MRI? All patients. All of them? Yes. Right. The reason is um, what, we, what it appears on the outside is not the total extent of the wound. It's a tip of the iceberg phenomenon. We need to know exactly what is the extent of the wound. We need to know whether there's any osteomyelitis features of the underlying bone and any important structures close by, there are very important red structures I call nerves and blood vessels. I don't care about veins, but if there's an artery, I'll be very careful. And nerves, so you need to know the anatomy before you put your knife on the patient, see to what extent you need to debride the wound, and any structures important. So we do an MRI scan for all our patients with pressure ulcers. Light. There's no time now for more questions, but it does raise a lot of questions because in the community we come across these innocent wounds all the time and we can't, they don't have access to MRI, it's very hard, or they, they can't literally get to them because they're so frail. So it just raises lots of questions, but it's improved my practice already, so thank you very much. Thank you.